Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We welcome your ways. They differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished by Jesus, the worker of miracles. There is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. We continue our worship now with special music by Charlene. How great thou art. I invite you to be seated. Now let us pray together our prayer of the day. Ever-loving God, your Son gives himself as living bread for the life of the world. Fill us with such a knowledge of his presence that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life to serve you continually through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the hearing of God's Word. Good morning. The first reading is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Wisdom is portrayed as a woman who invites people to partake of her banquet. Just as ordinary food is necessary for physical life, wisdom's food, insight, and understanding is necessary for the fullness of life with God. Partaking of wisdom's banquet is the way to the life. 
Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. And she has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. True wisdom integrates our new reality in Christ with our Christian fellowship and daily conduct. Because we are filled with the Spirit, Christians regularly rejoice together, give thanks to God for one another, and care for one another. In this way, we revere our Lord Jesus Christ. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. I'd ask you now to please rise for the reading of our Holy Gospel. Our gospel this morning is found in the gospel of John, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> in John's gospel, the feeding of the 5,000 now leads to extended teaching in which Jesus identifies himself as the true bread of life. Finally, in these verses, he makes a connection that would not be understood until after his death in light of the church's celebration of Holy Communion. Jesus said, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give up his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Holy Gospel according to John. Let me start out my message today with prayer. Lord, so often we wish for all kinds of things. We wish we had the power to make our wishes come true. But we realize the wisdom is through you. So when we're wishing, Lord, just let us be careful in what we wish for. Amen. Think about this. When you were a kid, and I know for all, almost all of us here, that was a long, long time ago. Okay? But did you ever fantasize about finding maybe a magical being that would grant the wishes for you. We see Disney things, we see all kinds of movies and that that have that in it. When you were a kid, you saw endless possibilities in the world, but yet when we were a kid, it was really limited too, wasn't it? What we could actually accomplish. So I think a lot of us, when we were younger, got a lot of sat satisfaction from imagining maybe a magical being in our lives. It could be like a genie, or a fairy, or yes, even an angel. But the movies and the stories along those lines, if we watch them, you know what they always have in common? They always have a moral. Do you know what that moral usually is? Be careful what you wish for, because 
it might come true. Reminds me of a story. An angel appears at a college faculty meeting and tells the dean, in return for your unselfish and model behavior, the Lord will reward you with your choice of either infinite wealth, infinite wisdom, or infinite beauty. Think about those three. Without hesitation, the dean says, give me infinite wisdom. Done, says the angel, and then disappears in a cloud of smoke. Well, then all heads now turn to the dean who sits around, and actually has kind of a faint halo around him now of light. Well, says a colleague that's sitting by him, let's hear some words of wisdom now. Say something brilliant. The dean stands there with a blank expression on his face. He looks around at the table and he confesses. Hmm. He didn't have any words of wisdom. He said, maybe I should have taken the money. For some of us, that could be funny. For others, no. But how many of us, if we had to make one of those three choices, would have a hard time making that choice. Wealth and beauty, they're important in our culture today, aren't they? They're noticeable. They offer a way to keep score, so to speak. But wisdom? Really? Let's be honest. What difference does wisdom make anymore? Wisdom isn't going to maybe get you a nicer car, which maybe though we could argue that a little bit. Wisdom might not really get you a bigger paycheck, or maybe it would, but Maybe it wouldn't. Wisdom's not going to win you any awards or make you the life of the party. But yet, there are so many verses in the Bible about the value of wisdom. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that the way of the foolish person leads to emptiness and, yes, to even death. While the way of the wise person leads to joy peace, and eternal life. So, if an angel suddenly appeared to you and offered you the choice between infinite wealth, infinite beauty, or infinite wisdom, which would you choose? I think as we talk about this this morning, the choice is going to get easier and easier. Basically, today I'm preaching from that second reading from the book of Ephesians. That book was written by the Apostle Paul. It was written that the, the book itself is, talks about Paul before he became a follower of Jesus Christ. Before that, before he followed Jesus, he'd been a member of the Pharisees, an influential Jewish sect that practiced strict legalistic observance of Jewish traditions and religious observances. As a Pharisee, Paul would have held a position of respect in the community. But when he became a follower of Jesus, he gave it all up. He gave up his influential, respected place in society. He gave up his community and home that he would travel around because he would travel then not so easily around the Roman Empire, training early church leaders after he found Jesus. He gave up his safety. He gave up his security. For the remainder of Paul's life, he faced persecution, beatings, and even imprisonment because of his faith. In fact, the words that we're reading this morning were written during Paul's first stint in jail. He knew what his decision to follow Jesus was going to cost him. And he knew what life with Jesus was really worth. And he spent the rest of his life then serving Jesus. So it was from the wisdom that only personal experience can bring that Paul wrote this. He said, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. 
Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think for us, the first thing that Paul wants us to understand today is that the foolish person lives as if there is no God. If there is no God, life has no purpose. If there is no God, then it's perfectly logical for everyone to simply do his or her own thing. Kind of seems like that's happening these days, doesn't it? If there is no God, there are no absolute values. There's no absolute right or wrong. No absolute truths. But people of God, there is a God. In Psalm 14, verse 1, it says quite plainly, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And thus the foolish person lives only for themselves <coughs> and only for the moment. The foolish person doesn't care about the consequences of their actions or the legacy that they're going to leave behind. They live for the moment. Most of you have heard the name Warren Buffett. He's a self-made billionaire, one of the richest men in the world. One time, Buffett was speaking at the University of Georgia. A student asked him for his definition of success. This is part of what he said. He said, I know people who have a lot of money, and they get testimonial dinners, and they get hospital wings named after them. But the truth is that nobody in the world loves them. If you get to my age, he said in life, and nobody thinks well of you, I don't care how big your bank account is, your life is a disaster. I think that's excellent advice from a man who has amassed more money and power than any of us could ever dream of. Probably if we took everybody's assets here in this room today and probably all the services, we couldn't even come close. Those things, he said, are insignificant compared to being loved and being respected and leaving a legacy of loving God and loving your neighbor. The fool sees no value in knowing God. The fool wants a quick fix so that he can get back to his own life. Back to those foolish ways. If there is a God and if there is a purpose to life, then the fool has a decision to make. The second thing that Paul wants us to know today, I think, is that the wise person knows that every moment of their life is an opportunity to know God and to live in God's will. The wise person knows that he or she belongs to God, and his or her first priority is to understand the will of God. What would change about your life if you saw life through the eyes of God and lived your life in the will of God? Would it change your attitude? Think about that. Would it change your relationships? Would it change your priorities, your work, your future? Paul knew that every Christian is like a magnet. You have an opportunity to draw others to God. You have an opportunity to draw others to hope, to truth, to new life. But you know what? Magnets also have the power to repel. If you claim to be a Christian, but you're still living like a foolish person, then you will repel people away from God. You'll waste the awesome opportunity that God made you for, the opportunity to change a life by sharing with them the love and joy of God. And then finally this morning, when you know God and live in God's will, then you can't help but be thankful. 
You see every moment of your life as a blessing, a God-given opportunity. An essential part of living in God's will is living with an attitude of gratitude. Paul closes then his Bible passage that we read today by writing, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul is writing these words from a Roman prison. There is absolutely nothing at all comfortable or predictable or even controllable about his life when he's in a Roman prison. He's lost everything that once defined him. And yet the joy and thanksgiving that flow from his letters when we read them in the New Testament are a powerful witness to the truth of God. This kind of thankfulness and joy can be found, can't be found in any earthly possessions or power or success or status. This kind of thankfulness is clearly a supernatural gift that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and having His Spirit live in you. I can't emphasize that enough. So, think about this this morning. Which life looks more attractive to you? The way of the wise or the way of the foolish? Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of each and every opportunity because, yes, the days are evil. Paul wasn't being harsh. He wasn't being judgmental. He knew what he was talking about. He was trying to save us from living as if there is no God and as if life has absolutely no purpose. It's an empty life if we live like the foolish person. And it ends, if we're foolish, in a wasted life. But there is another life available to each of us. One that is centered on knowing God and living in God's will. A life that is marked by joy and by thankfulness. And the end result of this life is purposeful living now and eternal life with God. If you want to have this kind of life, then I urge you this morning to pray and to ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Let him into your heart so that through him you can know God and God's will for your life. So the next time you're wishing for something, the next time you're wishing, be careful. You might get it. Amen. I would ask everyone now to please rise and join with me as we profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So this morning, rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, for the world, and for all of creation. God of wisdom, we ask you to enlighten your church, to guide theologians and biblical scholars, authors and seminary professors, as they seek greater knowledge and invite others to deeper understandings. We ask you to teach us to ask faithful questions and to open our minds to your living grace. God in your mercy. And God of creation, 
Mend the earth, cool warming oceans, and preserve melting ice caps. We ask you to increase our awareness of changing climate patterns and reveal new approaches to the challenges that we face in this world. We ask you to shield those that are in the path of hurricanes as we head into that season now and tropical storms. God in your mercy, God of all nations, direct our leaders, grant them courage to lay aside political grudges and renew their determination to address difficult conflicts. Guide them in the work of reconciliation and we also ask you to keep our soldiers safe. Hear us, O oh God, and God of compassion, Tend to those that feel wounded right now. Rescue those that are tormented by mental illnesses or mired in addictions. We ask you to ease the anxiety of those who are struggling with dementia. And we ask you to help those that are sick. This week we especially pray for David McNeil, David Mulkey, Pastor Marty and Lola Rugi, for Jody Porter, Connie Seidel, Claudine Ross, Brittany Ratchmond, Deb Jefferson, Laura Bartelt, Sally Bartz, Ryland Pruitt, Cynthia Greenwald, Alan Rep, Jeff Rothermel, and Diana Herzberger, and those also, Lord, that we name in our hearts. Hear us, O God, and God of the resurrection, bring to us new life. Give us the living bread from heaven, through which we abide in your love. And on that last day, raise each of us up with all your saints for eternal life. Hear us, O God. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's wave and smile to those that are around us. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this also in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God, show us how to resist all the forces of evil that once enslaved us. God, lead us deeper into your story so that it touches and gives shape to our everyday lives. Join with me now as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ that was given for each of us. This is the blood of Christ that was shed for all of us. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Receive today's blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We conclude our worship now with special music from Charlene. I need a helper for this song. <laughs> so, um, I really chose this last song for the young people in our congregation, and I was hoping that your little grandchild would be here to, um, to see it and hear it. So, he's going, going to be our our bubble man while I play Tiny Bubbles. I don't, maybe you all, most of you know this, but um, my husband, Fritz, he built this, the dulcimer. And, yeah. um, and he's, built, he's built four of them. So it's my favorite thing in the world to do. <laughs> well, thank you thank again. Thank you so much. Lawrence Welk lives again. Yes. <laughs> Please rise. So go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will. Have a great week. Have a great week.